Hello everybody watching on Facebook. Welcome to the Socialist Alternative online panel discussion. We're talking about the election of Keir Starmer as the Labour Party leader, what this means for the future of the Labour Party, for political representation, for working class people, and also how the struggle for socialism fits into the, all of this. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers tonight, including Labour Party activists, trade unionists, socialists, and a very special guest from across the pond. So I'll allow them to introduce themselves. First, uh, Paul Gerard. Hi, I'm Paul Gerard. I'm a member of Bury South Labour Party and Socialist Alternative. Next, uh, James Kerr. Hi, I'm James Kerr. I'm uh, a National Education Union workplace rep in London and also a member of Socialist Alternative. Next, Anna Barnett. Hi, my name is Anna. Um, I'm from Philadelphia in the United States um, and I'm a member of Socialist Alternative and involved with the Bernie Sanders movement. And finally, Hugh Caffrey. Hi, I'm Hugh. I'm a member of the Socialist Alternative Political Committee. And I'd just like to say right at the start, if you like what you hear us saying, you hear me saying this evening, contact us, join us, uh, discuss with us about joining in order to help build Socialist Alternative and support for our ideas. Thanks everybody. So we're going to get started uh, with our first question, which is to Paul. Uh, do you think that Keir Starmer's election as leader represents a setback for the left? Paul, we can't see or hear you there. Would you mind turning your mic on and your, your video. Mike. There we go. Oh. Right. Sorry, go ahead. Is that, is that okay now? Thanks, yeah. To answer your question, Becky, it definitely does mean a setback, both people in or out of the Labour Party. Starmer is a key establishment figure. He's a millionaire who was endorsed by George Osborne. George Osborne was the architect of austerity. Starmer is the one that George Osborne wants to lead the Labour Party. The shadow cabinet he's chosen is very much an anti-Corbyn one. 70% of them, I believe, were involved in one or other of the coups against Corbyn. If we draw a balance sheet of the last five years, we'd say that there's been a fantastic growth of the party. It's the biggest party in Europe. Fantastic growth among young people, but also people of my generation who spent years in the party. I was 25 years in the Labour Party, 60s, 70s and 80s. But people like me were repulsed by the pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist policies of Tony Blair, and we left in the 90s, but Jeremy Corbyn's succession to the leadership inspired us to come back to left-wing policies, nationalisation of rail, mail, energy, free higher education. They weren't just talked about as policies. They were also presented to the British people for the first time in three or four decades. And it was proved, especially in 2017, that they were popular and could win votes. The problem was that Jeremy and his allies thought they could come to an accommodation with the pro-capitalist right wing of the party. Labour MPs and Labour councillors up and down the country were busy implementing the Tories' austerity cuts, and that did enormous damage to the image of Labour as a pro-working class party, a party for the many, not for the few. Take the example, recent example, of Brexit. What Labour needed to offer 
working people was a clear pro-worker and internationalist which could have appealed both to people who voted leave in 2016 and people who voted remain. But instead of that, Starmer was given free reign to redefine Labour's policy on Brexit, dragging it away from an agreed position that Labour's conference was happy with and towards a second referendum, which cost Labour dearly in leave seats like mine. Corbyn needed to campaign for the open selection of MPs to give constituency parties the right to deselect or re-choose, re-select uh, their uh, MPs. And as long as he wasn't prepared to campaign for that and didn't achieve it, he was always going to be a hostage to the right wing. So in balance to sum up, we would say this has been a missed opportunity for a left Labour government, but we come out of the struggle with a, a strong left within the party still, which is hardened and heartened by the 80,000 votes that Richard Bergen got for a much clearer left policy. We've now got a handful of firmly left MPs, but they need to realize that the struggle isn't in parliament. I think that was another one of Jeremy's mistakes, being mesmerized by the parliamentary maneuverings. And they need to realize as well that their role now is to play a part in the class struggle. That class struggle didn't end last Saturday when Keir Starmer got elected. There are millions of workers out there, frontline workers like post office workers, like supermarket workers, who are resisting being dragooned into unsafe workplaces. We need to back them, we need Labour MPs to back them and publicise their case. Thanks, comrade. Thanks, Paul. So my next question is to James. Um, many of uh, many trade union trade unionists um, supported Rebecca Long Bailey in the the leadership, as well as many uh, trade unions supporting them nationally. Do you think that was because she represented a continuation of Corbyn's uh, policies? Um, I definitely think that that was um, obviously a big part of the support of trade unionists uh, and trade unions uh, as in terms of. A officially endorsing Rebecca Long Bailey. I think it was also the fact that specifically she defended the 29, um, you know, big tranches of the 2019 manifesto. Um, and uh, she also included in her programme specific demands about bringing trade unions uh, in, more into the heart of the decision making uh, of the Labour Party with, um, you know, with also kind of suggestions about further um, democratization uh, of, of the party and I think clearly Starmer was seen as um, you, uh, a figure that was going to um, push the party back and try to undo many of the, um, the gains that had been made uh, under Corbyn. We've seen that very quickly in terms of the appointments that he's made um, you know I think you know possibly with the exception of uh, you know a figure like Rebecca Long Bailey in uh, education, which I think as a as an NEU uh, member and activist, I think is uh, is an important um, you know area for us to you know to put pressure to to work with Rebecca Long Bailey uh, to ensure um, you know more radical policies. But if you look at the if you look at uh, most of Starmer's appointments, they have been uh, very much from the right wing of the party and a clear signal to um, you know to the capitalist class that this is about shifting the Labour Party back. Uh, to the so-called uh, centre ground. Um, and I think while we can say that definitely Rebecca Long Bailey was backed by, um, you know, the, the leaderships of a number of trade unions um, and a number of activists in those unions, what didn't happen was a campaign that kind of penetrated right into the mass uh, of, of the memberships of, uh, of the trade unions. Um, and really what was necessary in that campaign was to make it much more about what kind of Labour Party do we want? And Paul talked in his contribution about being a party of struggle, because, of course, Starmer himself was backed by uh, some trade unions. Um, you know, Unison obviously being one of the most notable examples with the Labour Link Committee within that uh, union, uh, you know, backing Starmer without a kind of, you know, mass vote uh, and so on of the membership. But, you know, Blair himself was also, you know, he won the vote in the Electoral College uh, in terms of uh, the, 
uh, in terms of the trade unions, the key question as a trade unionist is how, do, how does the Labour Party uh, orientate itself? How does it act as a party of struggle? Um, you know, sometimes the history of the Labour Party is presented as, you know, the trade unions just kind of, you know, came up with this, you know, this idea of having workers' representatives in Parliament. But actually, it was off the back of really significant struggles at the end uh, of the of the 19th century that, that brought about the need for a new uh, a new party. So I think the weakness in strategy, Paul's already talked about it, becoming mired in Parliament and seeing it about as parliamentary manoeuvres was a real um, signal to the rest of the party in terms of activists as well, that this was about turning inwards, administering, uh, you know, trying to win serious compromises and concessions, whereas actually what needs to happen is it turns outwards, it involves itself in all of the struggles of the working class in their communities, that it leads struggles, um, that the trade unions themselves win significant uh, concessions from Labour Party councillors, and uh, and candidates in order to gain uh, their backing, um, and, uh, and and that's what needed to happen in the leadership election itself. And I'll just come back to this final point on Unison. Of course, Unison, one of the, the you know the biggest unions that organises local government workers within that within that leadership election <clears throat> was uh, was Unison able to gain from Starmer a commitment that when he becomes leader of the Labour Party, he's going to use that position to mobilise Labour councils and Labour councillors to oppose uh, uh, local government cuts, to pledge that if he were to, uh, to become prime minister, that he would reverse those cuts. That's the role that the trade unions need to be playing in that, uh, in that leadership election to ensure that it wasn't just about, you know, who, you know a couple of uh, slight differences in terms of policy, or you know the presentation or the personality of the candidates, but very much about what kind of party do we want? And Corbyn talked a lot about, cre you know, and, and and others around him talked a lot about creating a movement. And there was definitely the beginnings of that, and that's still there's a residue of that that exists. But unless that movement is turned, uh, you know, to the to the um, you know the urgent situation uh, that, that's presenting ourselves at the moment, then that party will wither. Thanks, James. Um, so my next question is to Anna. Um, what we've been discussing about Corbyn and the type of campaign that he had, how does that compare to the campaign to support Bernie Sanders in the in the US? I mean, I think it's really clear that the Sanders and Corbyn phenomenons have had really massive impacts on society and also that both Corbyn and Sanders have been themselves pushed forward by events and by class struggle that has been happening um, in the past few years. And we've seen, you know, the corporate media putting out this narrative that both of them lost because they're too far left. And this claim that the elections of Trump and Boris Johnson are evidence of this rightward shift in society. Um, but in reality, we see that there's huge openness to socialist ideas and that the elections of these right-wing figures really show the danger of establishment pro-capitalist politics in opening the door for the right. Um, so I'm a member of Socialist Alternative in the US where we've been involved with the Bernie Sanders movement in 2016 and in 2020, this election. Um, and Bernie's campaigns have really served as, you know, a force that have raised expectations for working class people um, across the country in, his 2016 campaign helped inspire mass struggle, including the teachers revolts in 2018 and 2019, which was really the sort of rebirth of a labor movement in the United States. Um, and, you know, Sanders has, has put forward class politics that really like were unprecedented for anything, you know, as a young person that I'd heard a mainstream politician talk about in my lifetime, talking about, you know, the working class talking openly saying billionaires shouldn't exist. Um, and you know, that that opened the eyes of millions of people. Um, the Sanders campaign was known for its army of volunteers and record-breaking individual campaign donations. Um, and, you know, as socialists, we have critiques of, of Bernie's campaign um, and of some of his ideas, but the key reason we supported him so strongly and in, engaged with this campaign is the same reason that the ruling class really feared him. Um, and that was his cause to build a mass movement, which really galvanized millions of working class people. 
Um, and so in this election, Socialist Alternative endorsed Bernie. Um, we actively campaigned for him across the country, door knocking, phone banking, canvassing, holding events, um, going out you know, into our neighborhoods and doing that work and really talking with other Sanders supporters who are getting involved in politics about what the way forward is. How do we win this program? How do we win things like Medicare for all, um, a Green New Deal, all of these things that people are really excited about. Um, however, we were really clear from the very beginning, um, as well as in 2016, that we fundamentally disagreed with his decision to run within the Democratic Party um, and with this idea that you could take it over and make it a party for working people. Um, because you know the Democratic Party is truly an undemocratic party um, that belongs to the billionaires, the fossil fuel executives, the bosses, and is tied with a million strings. Um, and I think you know we see similarities, obviously, with the um, Corbyn phenomenon. But the Democratic Party does have some differences to the Labor Party, which I'm sure you know, other people could speak to as well. Um, in that you know the the mechanisms to you know build support for your ideas within the party really don't exist within the Democratic Party. And it's basically, you know, a party that's owned by the establishment, which is directly tied to the ruling class. Um, and, you know, we warned of the massive pressure and sabotage that, you know, that the Sanders movement would face. Um, and that was really, I think, brought to bear with the attacks on Bernie's campaigns by the corporate media. And we saw a lot of, the sim a lot of similar strategies um, brought down on Corbyn with just vicious mudslinging and red baiting, you know, accusations of anti-Semitism, even against Bernie Sanders, who is Jewish. Um, Super Tuesday, which is a huge day for voting in the US, um, a bunch of states vote. Um, the day before that was called Bloody Monday, where in 2016, there were just tens of attack um, pieces put out in the media. Um, and this time around, the establishment candidates um, most of them dropped out and consolidated behind Joe Biden. Um, and we saw the accusations of Bernie being a sexist, the stereotype of the Bernie bro, despite the you know very diverse, multiracial working class movement that you know was lined up behind his campaign. Um, and you know I think Corbyn and Sanders have have similar had similar shortcomings in you know letting their movements die down between the elections and not really channeling this energy that exists in society into a clearly organized independent force um, with you know, democratic decision-making um, and day-to-day you know, -day work in our neighborhoods. And you know, we've also seen them holding back, compromising with the establishment, Bernie calling Joe Biden you know, his friend. Um, and you know, that's kind of really come out in the open now. Um, I'm sure people have heard that this week Bernie suspended his campaign, which you know, we saw as a huge mistake. Um, and I can speak more to that later, but I think Paul is right. The class struggle isn't over, you know, with, with this election going on with the crisis that we're seeing in society, there's a need for this movement to stay organized. And that's a big question that we're facing now. How do we do that? Thanks very much, Anna. Um, so Hugh, the Labour leadership election was overshadowed really by the coronavirus uh, breaking out. And Keir Starmer used his victory speech to kind of say, it's important that we ignore politics now to all work together. And uh, do you think that that's uh, the case and that's what we need to do? Well, obviously, coronavirus is a desperate situation facing the whole country. But at the same time, it gets worse for you the poorer you are. And there's one rule for those at the top and there's another rule for the rest of us. The failure of the entire Labour leadership, Starmer included, factions in the Labour Party, various candidates for the leadership to really address the COVID crisis in any meaningful way has undoubtedly contributed to some people thinking that we should put politics aside in order to address the crisis. Now, what we think is that we need all sections of the working class and all sections of the Labour movement working together to address the appalling situation faced by so many people. We see so many workers in unsafe working conditions, Paul mentioned before we've seen the postal workers walking out from Scotland to Warrington to the southeast because they're being forced into handling mail in completely unsafe conditions, putting not only themselves but their families and the people they're delivering the mail to, which is the likes of me and you and everybody watching tonight. 
putting totally unsafe working conditions by their employer. And that's a very good example of what we say about how workers can force safe working conditions by a worker's shutdown of unsafe workplaces um, and insist on the right to either safe work or full pay being furloughed at home. Um, we see the desperate situation faced by workers and residents and service users in social care and in the care homes, which are facing a total disaster. And we think there that what we should see is the local authorities working together with the trade unions, the communities, and the residents and service users to step in, take these services over, and run them on a safe basis for those that rely on them and those that provide them. We see an appalling situation by people that are completely isolated in their own homes, hugely vulnerable to coronavirus, but to lots of other social ills as well. Those people are left isolated in our communities, and we need to build now on the heroic individual efforts of so many people to look after their neighbours and their street and so on. We've seen the Thursday clap for carers, a magnificent expression of solidarity with healthcare workers and care workers in general. We need to build on all of that and we come together as communities on every street and every estate to step in where the state and the market has failed to look after the 99%. But of course, none of that is what Keir Starmer means by working together. When Keir Starmer says, let's work together, what he actually means is, let's agree with the Tory party. Now, maybe somewhere there's a parallel universe where the Conservative Party politicians do things in the interests of working people. But on this planet, Tories do what suits them and they do what suits their rich mates in the corridors of power and the places of privilege. And what the COVID crisis has really shown, despite the best efforts of the politicians, and the media is that we're not all in it together by any stretch of the imagination. We've seen the huge sums of money given to Tesco's and the huge sums of money given by Tesco's to its shareholders. Those figures are not coincidental. Meanwhile, workers in Tesco's still face a deeply unsafe working environment. And of course, it's not only workers. We see the self-employed waiting until June to receive the payments that the government promised them the other week. Labour should be demanding immediate payments of 100 percentages or self-employed incomes given directly to workers and the self-employed, not filtered through the self-interested management boards and shareholders or delayed for months and months while the rent and the bills won't wait for working people. We see landlords taking the opportunity to evict tenants. Um, Labour should be demanding an immediate freeze on evictions, on rent and mortgage payments, and using its mass membership, it's still got half a million members. Those have never been mobilised in any serious way. But if not, now when? Labour should be mobilising its mass membership to organising communities against evictions due to people being unable to pay and to strengthen things like the Thursday night clap for carers. We've seen that there's immediate testing if you're an aristocrat, which I'm not, or if you're the Prime Minister. But we're still waiting for mass testing for ordinary people. And why is that? Because the Tories don't think we're all in it together. The Tories believe in herd immunity. They believe in let the grandparents and the vulnerable amongst the poor of the population die off, cross your fingers, and hope that profits and productivity have gone up at the end of it. That's not, by any stretch of the imagination, an agenda that any of uh, us can agree with or that most of the population would agree with. And it's not something that most people would think that a Labour leader should be uh, agreeing with. Um, we've seen health workers dying by the dozen because they don't have the personal protective equipment which they require, such as the right kinds of masks or any kinds of gloves or any sufficient quantity of safety suits. We see pictures circulating of health workers wearing plastic wallets and carrier bags because they haven't been given the adequate uh, uh, gear. And that is a result not only in general of the running down of the health service by the Tories and New Labour before them. But the actions of New Labour when in power in the early 2000s, when it privatised the NHS supply company called NHS Logistics, which is why the health service is now held to ransom by a thousand cowboy suppliers, none of whom are capable of adequately resourcing those very brave healthcare workers that are doing their best in impossible circumstances. So we're not all in it together when it comes to the, uh, the health service or the social care sector. 
And lastly, we see job losses by the thousands. We see the employers doing what employers always will do, which is protect their profits at the expense of their workforces. And what that demands is that the union movement act, follow the example of a few good uh, trade union struggles as a general struggle in defense of jobs. And on the other hand, that Labour should be calling for the public ownership of companies that make mass layoffs or the redeployment of those workforces to socially useful jobs, bring them into the struggle against the coronavirus pandemic through production of safety gear, through provision of services, through delivery of essentials, but on a safe basis, under the control of workers themselves. So we're not all in it together. And if we're not all in it together, we can't all work together. We can't trust the Tories and we can't trust the politicians who agree with them, which unfortunately includes Labour leader Keir Starmer. And that's why we say we need independent organisations coming from the workplaces, the communities, the unions, and rank and file Labour Party members to struggle for these kinds of things that neither Boris Johnson nor Keir Starmer, much as they might agree with each other, are willing or able to deliver for us. Thanks, Hugh. So, Paul, um, one of the things that's been said in favour of Keir Starmer is that he's more statesmanlike and he's more electable. Uh, do you think that Keir Starmer is electable? Well, frankly, I don't think the Labour's become any more electable than it could have been under Jeremy uh, Corbyn. And uh, it, it makes me think, you know, if the main focus in the Labour Party is winning elections, I don't think you'd start by bringing Ed Miliband into the fight. I mean, why not go hog and get Neil Kinnock back as well as Minister for Europe or whatever? But to be serious, I think it's a myth that Labour can only attract voters by watering down its policies and appealing to the centre. One thing that the election last year showed us is that there's no basis for a centre party in Britain at the present time. As was shown by the disastrous results for the Labour traitors, uh, people like Frank Field and Chukka Amuna, who walked out of the Labour Party, they weren't driven out of the Labour Party. They, they walked out of their own accord and in their own good time, tried to set up a, a, a rival political party. When that failed, they joined the Lib Dems to try to get back into Parliament and failed there as well, which tells us that there's no room in British politics for centre party at present. Contrast that with the position of Jeremy Corbyn in the two short years between him becoming leader in 2015 and the general election in 2017, the Labour share of the vote that went to the Labour Party went from 30% to 40% in those two years. And Labour won 30 new seats. I mean, Canterbury, of all places, went Labour in 2017. How was that achieved? It was on the basis of left policies that would appeal to people who were desperate to see the end of uh, austerity but also through organizing mass rallies up and down the length and breadth of the country, in football stadiums and everywhere, exciting people, mobilizing them to vote and campaign for Labour and to join the Labour Party as well. And sadly, we didn't see any of that in the 2019 general election. So subsequent to that, we've had an election for a new leader of the Labour Party. And in that election, Socialist Alternative supported Rebecca Long-Bailey to be leader and Richard Bergen to be the deputy leader. Now, Rebecca Long-Bailey was prominently associated with the Corbyn leadership and John MacDonald. And she had a good record of supporting workers in struggle and community campaigns and so on. But in the course of her election campaign, she took some early decisions which suggested that she was attempting to accommodate to the right wing within the Parliamentary Labour Party and the right wing agenda that was being set by the press and specifically over anti-Semitism um, and over the question of would she press the nuclear button. And I think she gave, uh, made some wrong decisions about that, which suggested that she would make similar mistake to Jeremy Corbyn uh, if she became the leader and would attempt to appease the pro-capitalist right wing. 
in the party. And I think that took a lot of the wind out of the sales of her campaign, and it wasn't helped either by her denial that she was the continuity. And that was what a lot of people in the Labour Party were actually desperate to see. They wanted a continuation of the leadership that Jeremy Corbyn had, had brought. So in the situation that's brought about a Starmer victory, it could have been avoided, but where, that we are where we are. We could be looking at a, a, a creeping or even a not so creeping counter revolution in the Labour Party. Early indications, even last Saturday, were that um, uh, Keir Starmer would be uh, attempting to use anti-Semitism uh, and the supposed extent of it in the Labour Party as a way of uh, beginning to marginalise and uh, possibly to expel the left. We don't know how that will pan out, but we will need to fight any witch hunt occurs. Now, some Labour Party members watching this now might say, well, what's the point? You know, it's won, we've lost. Uh, let's jack it in. But we don't know how the situation will pan out over the next six months. The left, certainly in my constituents, the Labour Party, are united in staying in, in staying together as a left group, as a socialist group, taking solidarity action, as we have done only this week with CWU members uh, locally, and not giving up the fight. We'll see after the Labour Party conference in September, hopefully it will still take place, and we'll see how people feel then. But what we need now more than anything, whether in or out of the Labour Party, is we need a firm, clear, non-sectarian analysis of strengths and weaknesses of the Corbyn period. And I think that's something that Socialist Alternative provides. If in due course, a new party emerges, as it may well do, we are part of an international movement. Some of our international comrades, for example, in Spain and Greece, already had the experience of new left parties outside traditional democratic or socialist parties. And I think working with them, we could gain their invaluable experience of working with groups like Podemos in Spain or Syriza in, in Greece. I think that will be invaluable. So whatever people feel about the Labour Party now, I would appeal to comrades watching this today to seriously consider joining Socialist Alternative in the immediate future. Thanks, Paul. Um, so, James, what now that Keir Starmer is the leader of the Labour Party, what sort of discussions do you think should take place now inside the trade unions? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, obviously, it's the, the election of Starmer is one factor, but we're only really a few months uh, into a Johnson government, uh, a Johnson government that is absolutely uh, riven by crises, um, you know, that is having to deal with, obviously, Johnson himself, hospitalised and potentially out of action. The whole question of Brexit um, has been uh, delayed uh, as well. And as soon as Johnson was elected, uh, members of Socialist Alternative in uh, their trade unions and their local communities raised the idea of the need for conferences of resistance, of, 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 of forums that brought together trade union activists, community campaigners, young people um, uh, who were campaigning as well, in order to discuss what the, the next steps uh, would be. And actually, that those kind of discussions are even more urgent now um, that they take place now that we've seen the election of Starmer in Labour and the, the moves to try to weaken uh, the left and to weaken the influence of, uh, of, of those uh, who are around Corbyn. And at the moment, obviously, a lot of those discussions will have to take place. We'll have to put take place online. And you know, we've seen a whole, uh, a whole raft of different walkouts um, from CWU members concerned about their safety, other unofficial action uh, from uh, uh, bin workers, uh, hospital cleaners and so on. And the, the kind of discussions that need to be taking place immediately need to be how do we strengthen and support those kind of struggles? How do we link those struggles up 
Um, and that needs to engage and involve uh, Labour Party members where, you, you know, where those, uh, th those Labour Party members want to, want to struggle and, and, and those who are uh, on, on, on the left. And I think there'll be massive variation actually around the country. There's been a lot of people who have torn up their Labour Party cards. They've said, that's it. This is, uh, you know, this is done. Um, there will be some others uh, who will stay in uh, and fight. But those who are staying in and fight, uh, uh, who, who want to stay in and fight, trade unions need to be uh, reaching out to those people and saying, you know, yes, uh, you, you know, we understand why you still want to pursue this within the Labour Party. But if you're going to be successful, if you are going to see any headway, then it needs to be tied to the struggles of working class people in your communities as well. And where there are left led uh, CLPs, then that demand needs to be made uh, and they need to be brought into discussions uh, around that as well. Um, but um, th th there are much kind of broader questions about what we, you know, what, what kind of political party uh, we want to want to see. And actually, I think we've got an opportunity here to discuss what we mean by working class political representation, because um, the, you know, the, the, the unions at times have been, uh, you know, referred to or viewed as kind of being, uh, you know, Okay, sorry, I think we're having to win uh, the demands. Sorry, James, carry on. There was just a bit of a delay then. Okay, um, so um, the um, you know what we mean by working class political representation is um, that unions are able to actually shape uh, the, the 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 policies of that political party, that they have an active role in uh, in in holding. Uh, put, you know, political uh, uh, representatives to account. The whole question of mandatory reselection, um, Starmer will very much try to push that. Um, you know, kind of completely push that to one side. But that should be an absolute, um, you know, pillar of uh, the trade union movement: the ability to um, to um, select your um, your reps, your workers' representatives, to recall them um, if you don't feel that they're doing. What you do should be central to um, to to our politics, and then there's the whole question of um, uh, of the wages of our MPs as well. And one of the things that is stark in this crisis is we can see the pressure on those on zero zero hour contracts, the low paid, but equally at the same time we've seen uh, quite generous subsidies in terms of the budget of ten thousand pounds given to MPs. In order to um, to uh, to mitigate against costs related to the coronavirus crisis, so Hugh's points about us not being in, to, uh, in it together uh, are essential. But trade um, trade unions should have um, you know an active role in ensuring that the representatives in Parliament are not using it to feather their nest and to build a personal fortune, uh, like we saw. Uh, with Blair and with others, that that work that that, that we should have uh, workers MPs on workers wages, um, and the, the trade union should be active in monitoring that uh, and developing that. We saw that with Labour Party MPs like Dave Nellis in the past, also Nadia Whitome in uh, the Midlands now, who's you know vowed to take a workers wage. These are really significant, uh, the, you know, these are really significant demands that need to be placed uh, on candidates. But I think. To kind of finish, the um, the discussions that need to be having uh, we need to be having now, obviously dealing with the immediate questions of the crisis, but preparing uh, you know preparing workers and uh, and and putting demands on uh, you know the political class for when this crisis comes to an end or even you know before it comes to an end, um, you know, it's likely we're going to see titanic struggles against cuts. Uh, against further uh, attacks uh, uh, to try and, you know, kind of make up for any losses from the coronavirus. Um, you know, we, we the, the, the climate, uh, the, the movement against climate change has kind of been put on pause by the crisis, but that will come back again. Um, and I think one of the things, one of the features that we've seen uh, in the last, uh, you know, decade uh, and a half, two decades, is that kind of residual support for the Labour Party that existed in working class communities has been eroded by right wing policies at local government 
uh, and, and at, uh, at government level. Um, and, um, and, and the role of trade unions and trade unionists is to ensure actually that we, you know, that we put an independent working class position to fight for decent public services, decent wages uh, for all, and, uh, and, and put that as a test on any political representative uh, that, uh, that, that, that might want to, to claim to represent uh, the working class, whether that's a Labour Party representative or if we see the development of new, uh, new left formations, uh, then that needs to be central to what we're doing. Thanks, James. So, um, Anna, in, in the US, now that Bernie Sanders has uh, dropped out of the race, are there similar, similar discussions taking place about where uh, people go now in, in, in the US? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we have to have sort of an honest assessment of the situation that we're in and, you know, the fact that Bernie has suspended his campaign, especially in a time of, you know, the coronavirus pandemic and an economic crisis, it, it is a setback for this movement, for the millions of people who fought for, you know, his program and for the political revolution. Um, and so I think there's a bit of, you know, the movement sort of trying to find its footing and, and, and asking what, what is the way forward? How do we continue, continue this? And, you know, as socialists, we have a really important role to play um, in you know, fighting for our ideas in this movement and, and pointing to what we think is the way forward. Um, you know, we knew from day one, you know, the Democratic Party establishment showed absolute contempt for Sanders and for the movement. Um, and there was these mountains of attacks, constant calls for moderation um, as were, were thrown at us at every turn. Um, and you know, although it wasn't likely in the in the in the past few weeks or so, it became increasingly clear that it was unlikely Bernie would able be able to win the Democratic Party nomination. Um, and things were really rapidly changing with the coronavirus crisis. It was still really a setback, and we we saw it as a mistake for Bernie to drop out um, because he you know abandoned this platform that he had, being able to be this mouthpiece for working class politics. Um, and this galvanizing force to keep people organized um, in, in whatever way possible in this time. Um, and so I think, you know, there's debates about what position we're in now. In his, in his speech, Bernie had said, our movement has won the ideological struggle. And I think that is undeniable. Um, most people in the US back Bernie's platform over Biden's. Um, and also talked about, you know, the, the generational sort of divide and the overwhelming support he has from young people. Um, and that is correct for now, but it doesn't mean that we inevitably win the political battle. Um, and so we're sort of, you know, on the back foot now looking for the way forward in this crisis situation. Um, but at the same time, you know, class struggle is really on the rise. Working people are looking for ways to fight back. And I think, you know, it's, it's very clear right now that the thing that we need is a new mass working class party and there's going to be need to be debate about what that means within this movement. Um, and, you know, all the, all the unions, both, you know, leaderships, you know, we have to be honest that the lack of support from most union leaderships was a huge factor um, in, in the shortcomings of this movement. However, at the same time, it's absolutely clear that this campaign was a working class campaign. The number one donors to Bernie Sanders are teachers. There's massive support in the rank and files and you know, debates and fights about undemocratic endorsements. Um, and so, you know, those debates need to continue about how we how we bring this movement forward. Um, and you know, in the US, obviously we have this two-party system stranglehold, and there is just a lack of sort of imagination about what it could what it could be like to have and a third party and you know what that party looks like is really important we don't want a third party just for the sake of it we want a party that is mat that is democratic that's a mass working class organization that doesn't take corporate money um like james spoke to that has representatives taking the average worker's wage and has a democratic internal life with meetings um where representatives are actually tied to the program and can be recalled rather than you know, being able to identify themselves as a member of a party, you know, no matter what politics they're putting out. Um, and I think that, you know, 
the unions obviously are completely vital to this process and also other organizations that have come out in support of, of Bernie, like the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America and other organizations. Um, and so in Socialist Alternative, you know, we have been putting forward the need for conferences um, and for discussions about the way forward for this movement. Um, and obviously, you know, we're in a, in a rapidly changing situation with the coronavirus crisis. Um, but I think despite the fact that, you know, Bernie's campaign has had sort of this contradictory effect in both pointing forward people into the Democratic Party, but also out um, revealing the shortcomings of this party, we're seeing frontline workers around the country, you know, going out and fighting, organizing, going on strike, Amazon workers, Instacart workers, um, workers in non-essential industries demanding the closure of workplaces. Right now there's 17 million people unemployed in the United States, which is just completely unprecedented. Um, tens of millions of people will be in, like, unable to pay rent next month. And so I think it's through these struggles that working class solidarity and consciousness are going to be built to help lay the basis for this new independent working class party to really challenge the corporate establishment that exists right now. Thanks, Anna. So um, lastly, a uh, question to Hugh. Um, why is political representation for workers important? And do you think that the Labour Party is gonna provide that? Well, political representation for workers is essential because if we don't have that, then we only have political representation for the employers with us allowed to agree, or us allowed to vote for candidates who agree with them, who will then put their interests first. And of course, that's what we get from the Conservative Party, and that's what we got from New Labour under Tony Blair. The devastating scale of the coronavirus crisis in Britain and globally is an unnecessary tragedy. It's a public health problem turned into a completely unnatural disaster by the capitalist system in general, but also the specific, staggeringly incompetent response of most uh, capitalist governments due in no small part to their total reliance on what they call market forces and what in reality is just simply the profits of big business. But that ability of those governments to rely in that manner on that level of incompetence and get away with it is in large part a product of the previous decades of conversion of parties like Labour um, and its equivalents internationally from being parties that stood at least in part on the side of the working class and through which at least up to an extent working class people could organise and struggle, the conversion of those parties from being, like I say, at least uh, with one foot in the camp of the working class into parties which loyally defended capitalism and everything about it, carried out austerity, neoliberalism, privatisation and so forth. And here in Britain, the crises that we see in social care, in health care, in public health, in public services in general, those are a result at least as much, in some ways more so, a result of what Tony Blair and his government did in office, as much as it is a consequence of Tory governments before Blair or since Blair. That unrestrained ability of right-wing capitalist politicians to carry out their agenda is what's created the conditions for coronavirus to be such an utter catastrophe um, internationally and in some ways particularly uh, when it comes to Europe in Britain. And so we can say that without mass parties that stand on the side of the working class, then not only will the employers' politicians have a free political hand to pursue their interests against ours, but the periodic crises such as wars, recessions, and pandemics are made even worse. They last for even longer. The working class is made to pay an even higher price because the capitalist politicians aren't subject to any kind of scrutiny. They have no fear of being replaced by uh, left-wing or pro-working class uh, MPs at the next general election. Now, as other speakers have explained, Labour's membership and leadership swung left under Corbyn and significantly so, but most of its politicians didn't. And at no point in the last four to five years has Labour become a party of struggle. And that, above all, is what we mean by political representation for the working class. Not only representation in Parliament, but a party through which workers can organise 
in between elections, in struggle, in dispute, in their communities and so forth. And what we will see now is Starmer attempting to reverse even those small ideological steps that have been taken under Corbyn. We'll see that approach of the shadow cabinet where the left is marginalised and some of the leading lefts excluded. We'll see that extended at every level of the Labour Party. The impression that has been given um, by the likes of Jeremy Corbyn that struggle and that working class people were welcome in the structures of the Labour Party is not an impression that Keir Starmer and his friends are going to give. Um, and while compared to Johnson and Co, Starmer's shallow cabinet can, and on occasions will, seem more rational, potentially more competent, less openly reactionary on some issues. What we will never, ever get out of people like Keir Starmer is class politics for working class people. We might get some fake concern about the plight of essential workers and the poorest in the society. All the better to cover up his real class politics. His real class politics are class politics for the ruling class. And so what we think we need, we need to see now is the real left across the board, inside and outside of the Labour Party, in the communities, in left organisations, perhaps especially in the trade unions, to have a serious discussion about what political representation really means what the lessons of the failure of Corbynism to achieve that through the Labour Party say about what is necessary going forward. And we'll make our own contribution to that discussion. We'll explain that, in our view, political representation for the working class is now unlikely to come from a Starmer-led Labour Party. Rather, it's much more likely to be created through the experience of mass struggles in the future when working class people tackle uh, capitalist society head on and learn for themselves the need that without political organisation, you've got one hand tied behind your back. And we will play our part in forging the best possible expression of socialist ideas, which inevitably at a certain stage means mass political organisation as well. The role, finally, that I'll, of a political organisation is struggle. And the biggest struggle of all is not that against particular governments or particular employers, it's against this system as a whole. And we will put forward the ideas that we think are necessary, yes, to struggle against individual employers, individual politicians, particular governments and so forth, but we'll also offer the biggest uh, asset that we have, which is a clear Marxist analysis and a solid programme, which enables not only action on all the issues now, but steps towards a socialist society where these kinds of struggles will no longer be necessary. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Hugh, and thanks to all of our speakers for an excellent um, event. If you have liked what you've heard this evening and agree, we urge you to get involved in Socialist Alternative. Um, as our speakers have outlined, a socialist organisation will be a vital tool for the struggles to come. So now is the time to get involved and get active. We're not waiting until the end of the lockdown, we're growing now and we're getting prepared for the important fight back which will be necessary to challenge the attempts by the capitalist class to make the working class pay people pay for, the, for their crisis. So join us today. You can put a message in the comment section below, message our Facebook page or fill in a form on our website at socialistalternative.net. As well as uh, joining, we're asking you for a financial donation we're an organisation which gets no funding from the establishment, which we're proud of. Our funding comes from ordinary people like you, because it's you that we seek to represent. If you can afford to make a donation of £50, £20, £10 or £5, it will all be crucial funds for building support for socialist ideas, support for workers in struggle now and in the future. And you can also receive a PDF or a paper copy of our newspaper with articles on the coronavirus crisis, the health service, strikes and the labour movement history. Get in touch if you uh, would like one, it's just one pound. So finally, we'd like to say thanks for everyone for joining us tonight. Solidarity with you all in this difficult time and forward to a socialist future. Thank you.